It's great to be here with you, Andy, and um, talking about fungal communication, which is such an important subject and one which you really don't have that much of an idea about. Um, fungi are peculiar in a number of ways, but one of their peculiarities is that they, um, they have these distributed bodies and indeterminate uh, patterns of growth. And so there's no a place where, well, no specific place and where they could be integrating, say, uh, what they perceive uh, with the, the next course of action. Um, and so they seem to be able to coordinate their bodies both a little bit everywhere at once and also nowhere in particular. And, and one of the really um, exciting possibilities is that they might be using uh, bioelectricity to do this, uh, might be using impulses, um, action potential like impulses to do this. And so um, it's really exciting to be talking to you about this and your, your recent findings uh, and their potential applications. Um, and and you've done so much work in unconventional computing. I, I love this term and I love that you uh, run the unconventional computing lab. It feels like uh, there's a lot of unconventional computing to be done. Um, it seems rather like a lot of computing is perhaps very conventional. And, um, but you've worked a lot with Fizarum, with slime molds uh, as, as biocomputing networks. And it's only more recently that you've turned your attention to fungi um, and have been documenting the way that uh, oyster mushrooms respond to stimulations um, with say flames or with sugar or salt, with spikes of electrical activity. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your, your findings to give us an introduction to, to what you've found and, um, and where you're at with, with this research. Okay, basically I started with slime mold, as you, tell, as you thought correctly. And uh, slime mold re responds to various types of stimulation, to chemical stimulation, to mechanical, to optical stimulation by uh, trains of the spikes of the electrical potential. And by making several sensors with slime mold, I thought that why not to try insert electrodes in fungi, fungi and check uh, how they respond. And uh, what's, for example, endogenous activity uh, of the mycelium. And therefore to start with, I insert one electrode in the uh, stock of the full body and another electrode in the uh, cup and record it for several days. And I saw that, uh, we can observe trains of spikes and the average width of the spike is about uh, 20 minutes and the distance between spikes is about uh, one hour and up to three hours. And distance between trains is maybe like between six hours and uh, 18 hours. So essentially uh, I saw that uh, my serial network behaves in a way similar to neural network because all parameters of the action potential can be found when we record mycelium network. And then kind of, uh, we started to dig deeper and uh, try to classify uh, spiking activity, types of spikes, distribution on the widths and uh, amplitudes and number of spikes of the train. And uh, then we stimulated uh, mushrooms or mycelium blocks uh, with uh, light, with mechanical pressure, with chemicals like chloroform to make them sleep and with uh, human uh, hormone uh, cortisol uh, to check how do they respond to stress. And uh, also in the framework of fungal variables, we attach patches of the uh, hemp pods colonized by uh, mushrooms to like t-shirt little mannequin I will show you later. And then apply some st stretching and also elimination of chemicals and check a spiking activity. And we found that indeed in all kinds of experiments Mushrooms respond quite distinctively to different types of uh, stimulation. That's what was done so far at the moment. And to what degree do you think the responses, the bioelectric responses of the fungi are um, an, uh, an active signaling process or an information transfer process? And how much do you think is just a byproduct of um, this trauma that you're inflicting on, on the tissue? Uh, I have no idea, to be honest, but uh, well, in theory, everything can be interpreted as information. Therefore, even if it's inflicted by trauma or damage to the cell wall, uh, this action potentialized spikes propagate in the mycelium network. And therefore, other parts of the mycelium network um, can respond. But uh, based on my experience with slime mold for the last like, 15 years, I believe slime mold use electrical activity to coordinate 
the whole the whole body of the protoplasmic network and also to shift the protoplasm back and forth to transport nutrients and maybe transport some signaling molecules so more likely mycelium network uh, uses electrical activity for the same purpose for the purpose of coordination because what happens we have well mycelium is very large you are the best person to uh, to confirm this uh, based on your book and uh, the largest the largest the largest mushroom is several hectares in oregon and uh, somehow the largest mushroom coordinates activity and behaves like a single organism and uh, more likely it can be done with electrical activity because electrical impulses propagate faster than chemical signals and you very memorably wrote a paper called uh, towards a fungal computer um, uh, suggesting that these bioelectric uh, impulses traveling through fungal networks could be used by humans uh, as a kind of biocomputer to um, to achieve certain aims and certain goals. And I wonder if you could talk to talk to us a little bit about uh, the potential applications of a fungal computer. How might these be uh, find a use in human life at this particular moment in time uh, on on our damaged planet? Uh... Difficult to say because I'm really I'm the person who usually stays uh, uh, quite far away from applications. But what I think, uh, if we insert, for example, 256 electrons in the mycelium, for example, it's in the forest, we insert electrons. We apply uh, Boolean functions of, of the length 256, we record outputs. So basically, this mycelium network will implement mapping of the Boolean functions. And uh, Exact structure, functional structure of the mapping will depend on the geometrical structure of the mycelium network and configuration distribution of repellents and attractants in this network. Therefore, from the form of the, this Boolean mapping, we can derive maybe, for example, uh, environmental state of the forest because mycelium represented or distribution of objects in the forest or overall health of the mycelium network or maybe it's uh, intentions, where it actually plans to grow and in what places it plans to fortify. That's one of the applications. In terms of our project Fulgar, we are making growing buildings from, uh, from mushrooms. Basically, we use fungal blocks and make buildings where some part of the buildings will be dried, uh, fungal blocks, and some parts will be alive. And this alive parts will react to light, chemicals in the environment, maybe to touch of the inhabitants, maybe to the hormones emitted by inhabitants. And then using these fungal computers, they'll make decisions about how to proceed. Maybe switch light on or emit some pheromones or maybe uh, open window, basically just like intelligent house. That's because uh, if we talk about speed of fungal computing, then bits of the spike is about 20 minutes, the 20 minutes, therefore, Basically, fungal computers very, very slow because mushrooms have nowhere to rush. They, well, they're kind of immortal, we can say. And when they're immortal, you can compute very slow. Therefore, they will never compete with classical silicon computers. But uh, they can still be useful in terms of like ecosystems to do some computation or in terms of fungal buildings where speed is not critical. I love this idea of... of um plugging into mushrooms and eavesdropping on the activity of mycelial networks. They're so densely uh, and intimately in, in, embedded in their uh, surroundings, and they have to be paying attention in some way to what's going on around them. Um, they're bathed in a rich field of sensory information, and it makes a lot of sense intuitively that um, we should be able to, in principle, uh, detect this, uh, provided that that sensory information is encoded in electrical spikes, but this will require some very careful experimentation to decode um, the natural uh, bioelectric language of the fungus. And this would have presumably vary from strain to strain and species to species and possibly from place to place. And um, I wondered if you'd embarked on this uh, somewhat daunting uh, program of research to try and decode these uh, spikes of electrical activity. Yes, that's what we are trying to do at the moment. Uh... So far, we submit one paper about complexity of uh, spiking activity. And we also compare it complexity of spiking activity with complexity of European languages. And like uh, the most complex European language uh, by uh, 
compression measure. It will be Estonian wine. I don't know why. And uh, actually, fungal language is even more complex than Estonian language. Therefore, uh, it stays like in the, on the top of the hierarchy of complexity of the European languages. There may be two versions. Either really mushrooms very well. I don't don't like word intelligence, but I will use it. Either mushrooms are really intelligent, or there are just plenty of noise, like oscillators distributed in the network, which kind of add uh, to overall complexity. But um, discovering language of mushrooms would be actually my dream, because uh, mushrooms form an important part of ecosystem. They like act like messengers between trees, insects, plants, and all other parts of the, of the forest, for example. And they understand language of trees, understand language of insects, and then somehow manage to translate between, between the species. Therefore, more likely language of mushrooms will be very, very complicated. But right now, it's difficult to say uh, what will be like for them of this one. Uh, my suspicion is that uh, most typically you can observe trains of about three, four spikes. And then the strains can be combined in more complicated words. Therefore, I would say that probably minimum for them would be three, four spikes train, which is about 20 minutes and which equivalent to about uh, two phonemes of human language, which is about 100 or uh, 200 milliseconds. So one phoneme of uh, fungi uh, is about 20 minutes, which equivalent of one, one phoneme of human language is uh, 200 milliseconds. Therefore, a 10 minute speech equates to two days of uh, fungal recording. This is wonderful. Um, I wonder if you could give us a little demonstration of this um, since you're in the lab. Yes, yeah, so first I will show you lab and then I can give you some uh, PowerPoint presentation, right? I will try to book. Uh, so right now, uh, I will try to put here. What I'm doing now, I'm doing experiments of anesthetizing mushrooms. I will just try to put closer like this one. So we have a hemp pot colonized by an oyster mushroom. We inserted electrodes. It's like eight pairs, eight pairs of differential electrodes. And in each pair, we measure difference between two electrodes. And um, I will just put on this on the screen. Yes. And then, uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, you can see now a little bit. Uh, that's electrical activity recorded on each of the channels. And uh, if we, for example, apply, I will show another recording. That's that, that recording of the long experiment. And at, at this part, uh, we just recorded endogenous activity of uh, hemp pot colonized by Western mushrooms. Then we applied chloroform. And then you can see visibly amplitude of spikes decreased and overall kind of complexity of the electrical activity, it's also decreased. So basically mushrooms gone into sleeping. And uh, then we removed chloroform at some, oh, chloroform evaporated at some point like here. And then you see spikes are restored, clearly visibly. And then we applied chloroform again, and everything gone down. So mushrooms gone to sleep. That's basically uh, one of the experiments. And uh, as you know, uh, what is the consciousness? Uh, last year ago on the conference of consciousness, I asked uh, Hamerov and Rasmussen, guys, give me like formal definition of consciousness. After many, many arguments, they agreed that uh, if any substrate can be anesthetized and decrease electrical activity on chloroform, for example, applied, the substrate has consciousness. Therefore, what you saw right now is demonstration that uh, mushrooms are consciousness. And by recording the electrical activity, we actually try to uncover complexity and structure of their consciousness. And thus, this mannequin, uh, we use using an experiments with uh, fungal variables and uh, that part, it's already dry, hemp part. And I will show you in the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, electrodes attached here. And then we apply pressure to shirt, just like, like this stuff. And uh, record electrical activity. And uh, these fungal variables, um, they respond to, uh, to stretching. And also, for example, if you apply brewing sugar, then uh, frequency of electrical activity increases because uh, mushrooms like 
brewing sugar. If you apply ethanol, we have like very strong action potential, probably damage to the cell walls. And then kind of uh, alarming spikes of activity because uh, mushrooms are not happy with et ethanol. That's what I have at the moment in the lab. And indeed kind of we're growing uh, plenty of uh, fungal substrates everywhere uh, for future experiments. This is marvelous. Um, could you show us your your slides? Okay, okay. Uh, share screen. Так, trying again. Uh, Google Home. Do you see fungal spiking slide now? Yes. Okay, so I will try to try to present. That's basically a picture of the um, first experiment when I tried like four years ago. I tried to record uh, in the wild electrical activity of mushrooms. And uh, that's, we see setup of experiments uh, already in the lab and electrodes inserted in the, uh, in the cups and um, stems. And uh, on the right, you can see very typical action potential generated by mushrooms. So we have depolarization, repolarization, and uh, some quite long um, refractory period. And here are examples of fungal spiking. And enlarged in the insert, you can see a train of spikes. It's three spikes in the train. And they also look action potential like. And uh, that's example of the electrical activity recorded during quite a long period. And we have several uh, several types of uh, of the trains. Uh, in one in one train, uh, frequency of oscillation about once per uh, two hours. On the left, this one, and uh, on the right, we have frequency about uh, five hours. Frequency distance between uh, between spikes in the train. So this demonstrate how actually slow thinking uh, mushrooms are. And uh, that's example of the fungal response to load. So by W with star indicates where we actually put about 500 gram on the hemp pot colonized by oyster mushrooms. And you see, we have one large response like spike followed by train of smaller spikes of high frequency. When we remove the load from the hemp pot colonized by oyster mushrooms, we again see quite large spike and then train of small spikes. A response to elimination is quite different. As you can see further, with L, with star, we see moment when light was switched on, so the hemp pot was eliminated. And then potential raised and stayed so at the race level until the light was switched off. And this phenomenon is repeatable. So we switch light again on, again potential raised, and when light is switched off, it goes down. So. Uh, Already we found that mushrooms can differentiate between mechanical stimulation and optical stimulation. To mechanical stimulation, mushrooms respond with one large spike and train of small spikes, and then activity goes normal. And then when stimulation is removed, we have nearly the same response. And to the light, uh, mushrooms respond, as you can see on the picture below, with raising potential and keeping it up until light is switched off. And uh, that's an exa example of experiments on the fungal variables. You can see a uh, mannequin with fungal pot attached, electrodes inserted. And on the bottom, you can see uh, how they are inserted. And uh, it's all recorded through amplifier uh, to laptop, basically. And uh, here's response to application to, of malt by star. is shown moment when uh, malt extract was applied. First part of reaction, maybe like two, three hours. Is basically response to water because malt extract is dissolved in water. But then you see high frequency spikes. And this high frequency spikes is a response to chemotractant because mushrooms like malt extract and probably they consume it. And uh, on this plot, you can see response by stretching. Response by stretching is uh, manifested in very kind of strong uh, action potential. And uh, that just 
couple of illustrations of the uh, model of the fungal computer. So we have basically colony. Uh, that's photograph of the real colony. And we put matrix of electrodes, you can see on the right. And uh, then we simulate some of the electrodes and the uh, waves of the stimulation, they run over the colony. And then we can also record responses on the array of electrodes inserted in this colony. And then to each combination of uh, impulses, we can assign a logical function. And you can see in the spot, for example, and not or and or or function or XOR gate in the, in the last point. And then we can take recordings, apply all, all possible binary strings to the inputs and uh, extract number of logical gates implemented by uh, fungal computers. And what we found in the computer model is that overall distribution of boiling gates is quite similar for mushrooms, slime mold, and plants. So more likely, all living systems, they have the same computational abilities. That's all, for, uh, that's all about, uh, about activity of mushrooms. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder one of the one of the other question that came arose when I was looking at those figures, and I was wondering in human brains, um, the, the neurons, the activity of individual neurons, the actual potentials that pass along individual neurons uh, combines with many, many other neurons to give rise to a, a sort of sum, uh, a field, an electromagnetic magnetic field that that um, that moves across the brain in, in rhythmic uh, frequencies. Um, and that electromagnetic field can act back on the activity of neurons. So the neurons activity gives rise to the EM field and the EM field can also change the activity of the neurons. And I wondered whether you'd um, look, done any investigations as to whether the, these fungal mycelia can uh, respond to changes in electromagnetic fields that surround them. That's a very good idea. We should, we should actually do. Uh, and then, then we can produce a paper together. Uh, indeed, uh, already in the 80s, paper were papers were published about charges of the tips of the growing of the growing kind of uh, mycelium. Therefore, each growing tip is actually already charged. And more likely, these tips generate action potential, which propagate further. And uh, by generating action potential running all over mycelium, these tips might be interact with each other. And indeed, the individual electromagnetic fields, they integrated into the larger field. And uh, yes, I have no, no answer, but I think uh, maybe even mushrooms can feel our own electromagnetic field or field of other creatures and somehow interact. That could be a fantastic topic for future studies. <laughs> I'm so uh, intrigued as to the way that because fungi can use bioelectricity to coordinate their behavior, then of course, other organisms do too. Um, obviously we do, uh, animals do. Um, Michael Levin, a, a wonderful researcher in the States, he, mm -hmm. he always says that brains didn't evolve their tricks from scratch, uh, that this electrical excitability is a really fundamental property of cells. And even bacterial colonies can communicate amongst themselves using uh, waves of um, electrical activity. So um, one thought that comes to my mind is that uh, once, you've, once you've decoded the way that these, uh, this fungal electro, electric language, then the next step would be to try and work out uh, how the fungi are electrically communicating with the organisms they associate with, uh, with the plants that they associate with, for example, or the bacteria. And yes. this would be a whole other field of research, but it feels like we're really um, at this exciting um, new beginning of research into bioelectricity. The bacterial work was done in 2015 or thereabouts, um, this fungal work has been picked up recently by you, although um, Stefan Olsen did some key work on it in the 90s, but no one touched it for you know, over 20 years. And so it feels like we're at this very exciting um, moment where people are beginning to consider bioelectricity anew um, in a way that, that um, perhaps it hasn't been considered for the last few decades. So this is so exciting. And I want to maybe to round off, if you can tell us a little bit about how you imagine the future of biocomputing. You've worked for a long time with slime molds. Um, and you've gotten to do all sorts of strange things. Um, and um, I've seen these demonstrations and I, I find them very amusing as, very, as well as very interesting. And, but I'm always left wondering, how is it that this would be something we could actually use? You know, and, and the idea is never to compete with, compete with silicon chips uh, because the you know, silicon chips are very fast and convenient. Yes. But so I wondered how you saw the, the, in general, the field of biocomputing developing over the next 10, 15 years or so 
uh, and what your ambitions might be for the field as a whole? Well, right now, uh, with Asia, I think that uh, key goal would be to understand language of mushrooms, language of plants, and language of slime moss, for example, as any other living creatures. Because if you manage to understand their language and communicate with them, then our world will become better. Because right now we don't know their language. We don't even know language dogs or cats properly, not talking about slime moth or worms, for example. And therefore we kind of standing alone in this world. But uh, by understanding language of mushrooms, we'll be able to merge with them and become part of very holistic ecosystem and live together. Because I think in future, uh, there will be no computers which are kind of separate from human body. It will be not necessary at all. Uh, we can use our brain as computer, as computer, and we can convey information by electromagnetic fields to other living creatures. So we can interact with each other and interact with other living creatures. So I think the future of the biocomputing is in the integration of four living creatures in one uh, harmonic system. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for your time, Andy. It's been wonderful to chat um, and, and good luck with the ongoing studies. And I'm very excited to see how, how they develop in the coming months. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Bye. Talking about future, it's like a computer board and we can see some parts of mycelium growing on the board. Yeah. And uh, right now we're just in the process of growth. But uh, my idea is to attempt to integrate conventional hardware in a very straightforward way by just growing mycelium directly on the boards. And then insert these boards into the computer and check how they function. I know it sounds silly and non-scientific, but I'm that type of guy. If I have some idea, I just want to try. <laughs> I, I love also that. have this. Sorry, please, Mali. No, oh, I love that thought. I, I, there was a study that came out recently which found that fungi had been um, digesting CDs. They could be making pits in the surface of CDs. And I thought it would be quite fun to give a blank CD to the fungus and then to play back um, the CD that it had made by digesting it. A bit, a bit similar to your um, fungal circuit board. <laughs> and basically, the, the fungi are very, very smart. Do you know about this? Um, predatory oyster mushrooms who actually kind of lure worms nearby them, then paralyze worms, and then eat them kind of basically alive where worms are paralyzed. So if we uncover mushroom intelligence and mushroom consciousness, maybe it will be kind of our way into the future because mushrooms were first species who arrived on this earth. And uh, that's my another kind of concept that maybe magic mushrooms intentionally try to show us future galaxies when you eat magic mushroom you see strange things and maybe it's a vision of the future <laughs> certainly feels like it <laughs> yes at least feels like exactly 